Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome once again to our weekly COVID-19 public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Dr. Earl Stoddard, who's Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, as well as Sean O'Donnell from the Department of Health and Human Services. As a guest today, we have Ian Anderson, Senior Director of Research for CBRE. With that, reporters, remember, if you will have questions during the Q&A portion of this presentation, use the chat. And with that, I toss it to you, Mr. Connie, Executive. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. For, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we want to start talking about uh, today's 55-plus barbecue bonanza. Our recreation department was hosting over 400 senior citizens at Smoky Glen Farm in Gaithersburg for a fun-filled day of food, activities such as games, crafts, nature walks, softball, and line dancing. And I took the time to thank people there for the vigilance and patience and the sacrifice of not seeing each other and for spending so much time on their own during the heart of COVID when they had so many loved ones that uh, they would have liked to have been able to see during the pandemic. Uh, we all shared that sense of loss, and uh, it was really nice to see people together for the first time in three years um, where they were able to go out to a picnic and enjoy each other's company. Uh, we prioritized our senior population during the pandemic. Uh, our seniors did what they needed to do to keep themselves safe, and since the vaccinations arrived last year, we've consistently held the highest vaccination rate for our 65-plus residents, and these efforts have helped us have two-thirds of the nation's death rate when it comes to COVID. Um, the things we did definitely made a difference in people's lives, and I appreciate the fact that people listened to the advice and took it. That certainly had an impact on how well the county was able to perform during this. Uh, the pandemic did make things very challenging for our older residents, but it's, like I said, wonderful to see that we can come back together and participate in events like this. A uh, little update on the effects of COVID on the economy. You can see from the chart above uh, that the county's unemployment rate has now dropped to 3%, which is um, about where it was before the pandemic actually hit. So it's uh, been a long, uh, long time, but the rate has, you know, continues to come down. We're hopeful this is a sign of more businesses opening up and particularly businesses extending their hours, which means they're able to employ more people. We've, um, we're 27 months into this and the pandemic and its hardships have had an effect on both residents and, and our businesses and it's still reverberating through our economy. However, we've seen some good indicators of an economic rebound. Our unemployment rate, as I said, is lower than we were before the pandemic last June. The unemployment rate was 6.5%, so we've been able to cut it in half, more than half, in the last year. We're also beginning to implement our FY23 budget, which is a very strong budget, allowed us to provide record funding to schools and affordable housing and climate change solutions. And uh, we're also able to set aside 10% of our funds for our reserve, and we're providing long overdue and much needed compensation increases to our employees, and I want to particularly highlight the police department, uh, where this year the council did pass um, the negotiated agreement, which allows us to become competitive with surrounding jurisdictions regarding police pay. This is, isn't being paid for through any federal COVID assistance or by raising taxes, and that's a long way from my first budget, in which I inherited a $90 million deficit. So it's nice to be able to work in a healthy environment and to be able to do things that we look forward to being able to do and had to defer um, during the times of, of COVID and when we were uh, most economically stressed. There is a deadline for rental relief looming. Um, you know, we've been putting out rental relief in the county and we're continuing to put those dollars out to the community. But I want to remind everybody that the deadline for applying for our fourth round of rental relief is looming. And so far we've received 2,400 applications with 95% of those coming from tenants themselves and 5% being submitted directly by landlords. 
Next Thursday, June 30th, is the deadline, and we're going to put the link to this application in the chat. And we would appreciate any coverage or sharing of this link through your social media networks or your regular media networks. To apply for these funds, households have to meet the following minimum eligibility requirements. They have to have experienced a COVID-related financial hardship. That means if you lost your job, it had to be related to COVID, such as your employer shutting down or the empl your employer reducing your hours. Households have to have a gross income from either 2020 or 2021 tax return or the previous 30 days that is below 50% of the area median income. And so you've got to be able to demonstrate that um, that your income was below the 50% area median income. I know there are people who are above that who are in the same boat, but with the limited funding that the county received, uh, we had to make decisions on where to cut off the assistance since so the cutoff point has been around the most vulnerable in terms of their incomes. Um, you have to have resided in Montgomery County since at least August 2021. You have to have an obligation to pay formally or informally, and you have to be behind on your rent obligation by at least two months. Besides immediate rent relief, we also want to move on the rent stabilization bill that uh, will cap rents at 4.4% countywide. We're beginning to get tenants writing us in saying they're facing 20% uh, rent notices. We have tenants, low-income tenants being told that they're going to be evicted, and uh, this is going to just compound people's problems. And with high inflation um, for our county residents, it's going to mean that people will likely lose their housing unless we're able to do something to mediate the effect of the rents. So this is substantially more at 4.4% than the county was allowing before. And we think it's, um, it's defensible and will help people retain their housing, though 4.4% is not an insignificant increase for people. Um, this is a national problem, and it would be nice if we could get some national action on it. In the absence of that, though, we have to treat this legislation with a sense of urgency and do what we can to help these tenants uh, be able to maintain their housing in the county. Uh, also, uh, the county has a program out there for hotel grant applications. Many of our hospitality businesses continue to experience hardships from the pandemic as well. And our fourth round of hotel relief grant program is set to launch next week, July 1st. Montgomery County hotels with 10 or more rooms and bed and breakfast with five or more rooms are eligible to receive up to $500 per room in assistance. The ownership of these facilities must be based in Maryland and have suffered a loss of revenue of at least 25% from September 2021 through January 2022, compared to September 2019 through January 2020. Applications can be found online at the Montgomery County Business Portal, and we're going to put that link in our chat, and applications will be accepted there through July 22nd. Our leisure and hospitality businesses currently employ about 12% of our county's workforce, and the World Tourism Organization has predicted this sector will not recover fully until 2024. So it's imperative that we continue to help where we can, and we're using ARPA funds provided by the state of Maryland for these grants. And to date, more than 6 point, sorry, $6.8 million has been previously distributed to our hotels. So I encourage all eligible county hotels and bed and breakfast to apply for this newest round of grants. Um, we're also going to talk about the CBRE report, which is Life Sciences Research Talent 2022. Uh, this industry is critical to us evolving, uh, helping evolving uh, COVID from a pandemic to an endemic. Uh, as it changes, the life sciences industry obviously has played a major role in both vaccines and treatments, and Montgomery County happens to be the epicenter of a lot of that activity. Uh, the industry isn't just saving lives, it is a big business and a great opportunity in the county for sustained high paying jobs and uh, job growth in our county. And I'm glad that we're being joined today by Ian Anderson, Senior Research Director from CBRE, to highlight the recent report regarding life sciences talent. The headline from this report from Montgomery County in our region 
is that we have moved up to second in the nation as the best place to find the workforce that this industry needs. As you can see from this chart, the life science industry has continued to grow um, at, a, at the fastest pace on record. There's 131% growth in this sector, sector over the last 20 years throughout our nation and within Baltimore, um, Washington metro region, Montgomery County is the epicenter of this growth. As home to some of the nation's largest life science companies like United Therapeutics in Silver Spring or Novavax in Gaithersburg and you know, a host of other companies, private sector businesses, large and small, are recognized in the proximity to NIH and FDA as well as our region's education and talent in the workforce makes us unique and a desired location for their businesses. In fact, it was just announced this week that GSA has renewed its NIH leases totaling 350,000 square feet in two Bethesda buildings that will keep them at their current location on Democracy Boulevard for another 10 years. This is important and good news for the county and I want to thank our congressional delegation for their advocacy and support to keep NIH in Montgomery County. And on our end, we're committed to growing this life sciences talent pool. Last year, we signed an important MOU between the county, Montgomery College, the University of Shady Grove, and the University System of Maryland, and our life science companies that will connect our students to this industry, providing them an incredible education experience while ensuring we provide the well-trained and well-educated potential workers for this industry. I know from talking to you know any number of companies that have come here or are thinking about coming here, that talent is absolute one of their frontline considerations. They want to know that if they do arrive here, that there's going to be a building talent pool because they expect to grow and they want to know that this area is going to be able to provide the talent they need. That's what we're aiming to do. And I'm going to turn it over to Ian to go over the report and then we'll take any questions about it before we move to the rest of our weekly COVID update. So Ian, it's yours. Sure. Thank you, Mark, and uh, hello to everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. I'm uh, calling you from today from Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, where I'm based. I'm a senior director of research with CBRE. I head life sciences research. I also help with thought leadership efforts on behalf of CBRE in the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, what CBRE does really briefly is we for the most part, we have various avenues of our business, but for the most part, we represent landlords and developers of all sorts of different types of commercial real estate space. We also represent companies and other organizations who are looking to lease or own commercial real estate space. And so uh, regarding the life sciences industry, we represent some of the largest, most of the largest biopharma companies in the world who are looking for space, looking to grow. And one of their biggest challenges that they tell us at this point is they've seen dramatic growth over the last several years. And for many of them, they've never had a harder time trying to recruit or retain life sciences talent. So uh, I'll share my screen if that works. And so we, uh, created this report on life sciences research talent in 2022 to help our clients find, identify, and access the most favorable talent pools of life sciences researchers in the United States to help the industry continue to grow. A um, couple of things. One, our report was, was not industry-wide. It doesn't look at the entire all the talent that the, that the industry may use. It looks and it focuses on the core research functions of the industry. Those life sciences researchers or those life scientists who are the ones who create all the innovations in the wet laboratories. It does not include a lot of the other occupations or functions in the life sciences industry that might be sales, uh, marketing, even management, et cetera. So um, if I move to the next slide here, it'll show you some of the growth of these life sciences researchers, some of the specific occupations that we've looked at and we've examined in this report. We evaluated the top 74 
life sciences markets in the United States and evaluated them on this talent. And we used, and it was all based upon a metropolitan statistical area. So it wasn't based on the county. Uh, we did that for a couple of reasons. One is because when our clients are looking to uh, locate in certain places, they want to find the, the widest pool of talent that they can access. And so for the Washington DC and Baltimore regions, we combine them into one. The Census Bureau considers that a com combined statistical area. Uh, we did the same for San Francisco and San Jose. I think it's notable that uh, you might probably call the heart of San Francisco, the San Francisco Bay Area's life sciences ecosystem in South San Francisco. Um, and and in obviously in the DC Baltimore region, the heart of the ecosystem is Montgomery County. And they have some similarities there. So this, they have about the same difference in, in, uh, in distance between San Francisco and San Jose that you have between DC and Baltimore. And so, um, and then you have these, these regional universities around them. So we've seen this incredible growth throughout the industry. It continues to grow. Our clients are asking us, where do we go next for continued growth? And probably the biggest takeaway from our report is we used the various criteria, mainly looking at one, where the biggest number, absolute numbers of life sciences researchers are located in these markets, what markets have the highest density of these researchers, but also where are the most graduates with life sciences expertise. And so based upon all that criteria, this is our rankings. It's a real testament to the region. And I'd say Montgomery County and the fact that Washington, the Washington DC Baltimore market ranked number two, only behind Boston Cambridge. Uh, we certainly have a little bit of skepticism from our colleagues and some in the San Francisco and San Diego uh, area as to how high uh, Washington, Baltimore, and actually New York and New Jersey scored in our rankings. But uh, again, it gets back to the massive talent, the number of talent, the, the, the educational institutions. And we feel uh, somewhat um, comforted by the fact that, you know, I would imagine Amazon, when, went, when they went through their evaluation of markets around the United States for their HQ2, they probably uncovered the similar type of data here, which is the massive talent. Where do you need to go to grow? Where is the educated talent? Where are the university institutions, et cetera? Uh, when they chose the Washington DC region and New York for their HQ2. So that's the big takeaway. Um, just a couple quick items, details, and I can wrap up here. When we really dig into, we look into where these occupations are located in all these top 25 uh, markets. Uh, a couple of reasons why Washington, the Washington Baltimore region scored so well. One, it's pretty remarkable that this region has the largest number of biological scientists and microbiologists in the entire United States. And those are in those red circles. And then those orange circles, it has within the top three or four largest number of medical scientists, chemists. And what's becoming increasingly important for the life sciences industry is, is the high tech industry, the software folks. And so we have uh, one of the largest uh, numbers of data scientists and people with mathematical science occupations. So that helped it show up exceedingly well, but it wasn't just that. It was also the number of educational institutions, those with graduates in biomedical and biological sciences. And so the Washington, D.C., Baltimore region was number three in those number of uh, graduates. Notably, not surprisingly, Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, but I think it's become increasingly um, obvious to some uh, of uh, in the industry that there's a lot of graduates also coming out of Georgetown, George Mason, uh, Howard, et cetera. So some uncovered gems within the region people may be um, just beginning to notice. Uh, lastly, and I'll leave you with this, another, another criteria that went into our rankings of this, which we saw in a pretty impressive and surprising correlation that was somewhat unrelated to the life sciences industry, but the biggest cluster, the most successful life sciences clusters in the United States had some of the strongest correlations with the density of simply the population with a, any PhD 
not related to just life sciences, but any PHE. So it's just, it reflects a very highly educated population in those regions, but also those employed in professional, scientific and technical services. Um, essentially uh, a key value add white collar jobs. And so no other region in the United States scored as well with those holding a PhD and having the percentage employed in professional scientific and technical industries. You can see here what the Washington DC Baltimore region is really up with these elite top five cluster life sciences clusters in the United States, right up there with San Francisco, Boston, and a key cluster in Raleigh Durham. So with that, um, you know, I'm happy to share the report with anybody, or I, I don't know if we're answering questions here, uh, but you can also see the report. Uh, you can find the report either on CBRE's website, but I think you can even Google CBRE Life Sciences Talent Report 2022 for further information. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for that uh, presentation, reporters. If you have any questions regarding the report and or economic issues, this is the time. Any questions for Mr. Anderson and or the county executive? Going once, going twice. All right, I guess we move forward with the public health update. Please unmute Mr. County Executive. So thank you, Ian, for being here again today. and. Uh, I look forward to working with you as we plot our way forward. And I'm excited because, you know, we're working with the University of Maryland to actually bring our graduate program to the county. And that would be the first of the graduate level located in the county. Uh, so it's nice to have all this activity around us. It's time to bring some of that activity here. And that's what we're working on. Okay, um, thanks for having me. Thank you. This week, our case rate is at 233 per 100,000. So you can see we've been steadily more or less going down with a little blip there at the end. This is about where we were last week. Our COVID hospitalization rate is at 7.3%. And uh, we still are in the CDC's community level of medium. And I also want to send wishes for a speedy recovery to Councilmember Katz who caught COVID earlier this week. And he's currently quarantining. Um, I'm glad he's doing well, but this is a reminder that this virus continues to mutate and be prevalent in our community. Uh, the big news this week is the initial rollout for infants and toddlers from six months to five years of a new vaccine. This is the last significant group to receive their vaccinations. And we know there are lots of parents anxious to get their young children vaccinated as quickly as possible. So I just want to um, let people know what the state of the number of doses is, because this is really important. I don't want people to think that we've been given all the doses we're gonna to need um, to vaccinate children in this county. To the contrary, the county itself has about 2000 vaccines we got from the state. And that's the number that's on hand by the county for an estimated 35,000 to 40,000 infants and toddlers in this age group. And we anticipate that we're going to continue to get more vaccines on their way. The state is also providing vaccines to local pediatricians, but to individual pediatricians, not in large quantities. So it's not available. The other 38,000 doses aren't out there someplace else in Montgomery County. There's, there are small doses available in the, with our local pediatricians. So the bottom line is we have limited doses and they're likely to run out due to this initial demand. And in fact, if this is the level we get for the next couple of weeks, you can be pretty sure that we'll run out each week before we get the new doses in. That said, the best thing parents can do is check with their family doctors first. We know that some private practices like the Capital Medical Group and Chevy Chase are setting up their own clinics. And vaccine.gov is a great website that provides up-to-date information of where you can find vaccines and boosters near you. So use this site to identify where these vaccines are available. As far as our county clinics, we're going to start a handful of clinics that are being positioned around the county under our equity framework and goals. There are a lot of people who don't have insurance and don't have access to transportation 
for whom getting their children vaccinated is going to be extremely difficult. And so, as we did before, we're trying to make sure that those who normally would be least likely to get it um, or get it early are also able to get access to the vaccines. There will be approximately 300 appointments per clinic, and this will be by appointment only. Right now, we're not doing walk-ups uh, because you don't want people standing in line um, for vaccines that aren't going to be there. So it's limited this week. It may be limited for a couple of weeks. Similarly to the vaccine dis distribution for 5 to 11-year-olds, these vaccine doses are different from those used for teenagers and adults. They're smaller. Well, we want to vaccinate as many of these babies and toddlers as fast as possible. We are beholden to the supply. And as with previous groups, our clinicians will prioritize safety in this initial rollout. Uh, we saw a similar rush of demand with our 5 to 11 year olds, but that was a larger cohort. Uh, we got through that demand in a few weeks and we expect the same success with this age group. So be patient. And uh, like I said, try to get your appointments. If you've got a private provider, see if they've got the vaccine. And if they don't have the vaccine, uh, always check with the county to see what we're going to be structuring for appointments. We're going to um, point, uh, we're going to post appointments at 3 p.m. on our vaccine page as supply is available. And that's www.govaxmoco.com. That's www.govaxmoco, one word, sort of, dot com. There's also a page specifically for this age group, and it includes more specific information on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that have been approved for this. Uh, the federal um, impact statement on the I-270 uh, Beltway project is out. Um, last Friday, the State Highway Administration released the federal environmental impact statement on their plans to add toll lanes to I-270 and the Beltway. Uh, we're still reviewing this 26,000 page document, um, but our stance is um, same as it's been. I continue to believe the design of this project is fundamentally flawed, um, far more expensive than it needs to be. And the study clearly finds that the choke points are going to continue to exist. In other words, if you're at the ICC in North, you will be in misery. In fact, as you approach the ICC, you will be in misery as those lanes collapse down to fewer lanes since there is no plan and no date for when they intend to extend, extend this highway up to Frederick. Um, I've been advocating from the beginning that this thing go from the bridge to Frederick, that they not tell us they're going to come back in five or ten years and do the upper part of this because that's going to continue to leave large portions of the Beltway paralyzed and there's no reason for that to have to be the case. And we're going to continue to hope that the administration or the new administration is willing to go to the federal government to try to get money from this project without money from the federal government like we got for the Woodrow Wilson Bridge. So we're not doing something unheard of and this is a major interstate highway with a bridge that needs to be replaced, let alone expanded. There's no reason to believe that we couldn't get some help and any dollars we got from the federal government would reduce, reduce the burden on county residents and others who are trying to use the toll lanes. Um, it's that simple. I mean, the toll lanes are designed um, to keep people on the regular roads who can't afford the tolls and to keep the toll lanes flowing more freely. And so the fees are set so there's a measurable difference between riding the toll, toll lanes and not. And on top of that, the fees, as we found out, are going to be very, very high at rush hour. So going to the federal government, I think, would be a wise and prudent thing. And it's hard to believe that that's not something that we didn't do from the beginning. But I'm hoping that changes either under this, um, this administration or that the next administration coming in decides that it's a necessary thing to do to provide this additional support. Um, Last week, we, weekend, we celebrated Pride in the Plaza. We had many events honoring and celebrating Juneteenth. We had great weather and we had big crowds. And this weekend, we're celebrating uh, the county's marquee Pride Month event, which is Pride in the Plaza in downtown Silver Spring. And it's on Sunday from 12 to 8 p.m. 
This is an all-day festival celebrating LGBTQ plus artists, businesses, and support of nonprofits. And I look forward to attending and hope to see many of you there as the county shows its pride. And finally, I want to congratulate Mayor Browser on her victory in the primary last night, uh, essentially assuring her a third term as mayor. Over the last four years, she's proved, provided stable and effective leadership to her constituents, as well as our entire region through these unprecedented times. We do appreciate her partnership with Montgomery County regarding our toughest challenges, whether it was COVID or public safety, affordable housing or combating climate change and economic development. So. Um, congratulations, Mayor, and um, now I'm going to turn this over to Sean and Dr. Stoddard for their updates. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. County Executive. So, uh, going into the, um, are you able to see the, the slides at this point? Okay. Uh, going in very briefly into the uh, some additional surveillance, just wanted to share with our, our media partners, um, we continue to track uh, our neighboring cities and we can continue to look uh, across the um, national capital region at the COVID case rates and see where they're going. And much like our numbers are coming down, we're seeing that in other places uh, across the East Coast and across the country. Uh, the, the latest update from CDC uh, typing of the variants is that they are projecting that we are now uh, seeing an increase in our uh, BA4 and our BA5 variants um, in comparison to the BA2 and, and BA2.12 uh, variants. And as you saw our numbers coming down, uh, that's that's the decreases of those BA2 uh, subvariants. Um, and again, we're, we're, we are seeing some cases of the BA4 and BA5 across our region. Um, but again, overall, our, our cases have been uh, coming down in general, um, held a little bit similar over the past week. Uh, again, this, this is nothing new, but just tracking within Montgomery County, we're, we're seeing something that's been consistent across national data, which is even with a high number of breakthrough cases during the Omicron phase, um, those that are that still remain unvaccinated are significantly more likely to become a case than those who are fully vaccinated. It may be that uh, many of the fully vaccinated cases um, are subclinical, uh, that they don't have symptoms and, and, and maybe um, they're not being caught. Uh, but again, that, that is a, an improvement over having more serious illness um, for the unvaccinated. Looking at our hospitalizations, um, our, our numbers of COVID patients, uh, we have 99 COVID patients across all of our hospitals in the um, alternate care center. We're seeing a little bit of decrease from last week in acute care and a, a slight increase in our ICU patients. Again, that is some of the natural progression as, as some patients become, uh, their, their disease progresses where uh, many of the other patients are, are now moved out of the hospital. Um, and we do have 44 patients still at our uh, alternate care facility in Tacoma Park. Uh, still tracking uh, the death rates, both in the county and across the state. Um, we did see uh, some increased activity in May, and we're seeing uh, right now um, a little bit in June as a result of this last wave, uh, still far lower than what we saw with the earlier Omicron waves, and still a, a lower rate in our county than um, our, our percentage of population across the state. We still believe that the actions our, our residents are taking and uh, the precautions they're taking as well as the vaccination rates um, and booster rates are helping to keep these lower. Um, speaking of vaccination rates, of course, they are very high for the 12 and above. Um, our 5 to 11 uh, fully vaccinated rates are in the area of 64 to 65%. That continues to increase uh, slightly over time. Um, we should have a new age group to add to this in the very near future. Um, one thing to, to mention to our media partners is the state and the, the CDC are shifting to a weekly reporting of uh, the vaccination rates. So this will, um, I believe it'll be updated potentially on, on Fridays. 
um, with the state. And uh, again, it, we'll, we'll have that weekly for, for you all. Where we'll see the most movement is of course in the under five um, age ranges. Um, you can already see that we are start, We are seeing uh, the five to 11 year olds come in for boosters, um, much as the other age groups continue to go up slightly over time. And we are encouraging everyone to get their boosters when they're eligible. Uh, the immunity wanes across all age groups. And so it is important to get those additional doses. And as you'll hear uh, shortly, um, even with the younger age groups, uh, a third dose has been incorporated with some vaccines. So the, the update on the under five vaccinations, uh, late last week, uh, the FDA um, approved the vaccines for both um, Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, the next day, the CDC endorsed those recommendations. The, the only slight difference here is the CDC endorsed the, the vaccine for the six months to four years uh, with Pfizer in the six months to five years for Moderna. They have not met to discuss the six to 17 for Moderna. So those uh, families who maybe um, have been waiting for a different mRNA vaccine for that six to 17 population, um, or even a different one potentially for boosters that hasn't been reviewed and approved yet. Um, but yes, the six month to four years, six month to five years, that was reviewed and approved. On um, Monday, our partners at the Maryland Department of Health updated their standing orders that we could begin the vaccinations. Um, and on Monday, we began receiving vaccine. Um, we received part of what we ordered. We're, um, I'd have to check with our, uh, with our disease control um, and immunizations team to see if we've gotten the rest of it. But we, were, um, we did start to receive um, parts of that. So we do expect our, our vaccine amounts will go up this week. Um, and then it may be, uh, it may be a, a week or two before we get another uh, vaccine shipment uh, just because of the, the breadth and scope of rolling out a new vaccine formulation to a very large number of providers, pharmacies, um, and health departments. Uh, where can you get the vaccine? Um, as our county executive mentioned, vaccines.gov is a great website that helps you uh, look up um, vaccine availability. You can check off which type of vaccine you're looking for. Our, our, again, our colleagues at the Maryland Department of Health have a very similar engine that uses data with uh, exclusive to Maryland. Uh, this is a screenshot from about 10 minutes ago uh, that includes the pharmacies um, within 17 miles of Wheaton uh, that have the six month to five year or four year uh, vaccines. And that was about 29 pharmacies um, within this vicinity of Montgomery County. Some of these are Prince George's, um, maybe uh, a few are Howard, but there are already many, many pharmacies on this. I, I um, believe shortly the health department clinics will be added to it as will any um, pediatricians who choose to um, answer the survey and get put on this list. Uh, but we are recommending people contact their individual pediatricians. They may not want to list publicly, but they may have it available for their practices. A lot of the vaccine is going to those practices. Um, and again, some is going to pharmacies. Uh, when you use these search engines, I do want to recommend to the public, they have information and details about those clinics and they have contact information. Some pharmacies may only be giving vaccine to individuals who are three and older um, based on their, their rules and regulations. So please look at that before you make the appointment. The county sites are doing uh, six months uh, to four or five, depending on the vaccine um, for our clinics. Um, and again, this is what, if you go to vaccines.gov, you can see, you can check the specific type of vaccine you're looking for. Uh, we, again, we're, we're uh, encouraging everyone to, to get these vaccines as they're eligible. We know that the younger age groups um, are less likely to have serious illnesses, but can still spread this amongst their families or their contacts. Um, and we did see an increase in hospitalizations uh, amongst younger populations during the Omicron phase. And we, we don't know how the next variants will look in our area. So we are encouraging people to get vaccinated uh, now. Uh, just to briefly uh, mention the slight differences, the Pfizer vaccine is six months to four years and is three primary doses uh, uh, separated by, the first two are separated by three to eight weeks. 
Um, and uh, it, it's the family's decision of, of what time frame to come in uh, for that second dose, um, but it needs to be at least three weeks. And then there's a third dose at least eight weeks after that second dose. Uh, the Moderna is a two dose vaccine um, and there's a, at least a four week period between the first and second dose. Um, the, the only real difference is with, if there are uh, populations who are moderately or severely immunocompromised, um, they are recommending that shorter interval, that minimum interval for first or second dose. And uh, Moderna is actually recommended to have a third dose like Pfizer for moderately or severely immunocompromised. And we'll have all that uh, clinical information available at our sites. Uh, those were the, um, the updates we have from public health. Uh, I'd like to uh, see if Dr. Sauter has any additional comments. Thank you, uh, Sean. I just want to reiterate a couple of pieces to this. Um, uh, first off, um, obviously the role of the county is really the social safety net. Uh, many of the pediatricians and, and primary providers, they're, they're, they're not necessarily always following an equity framework in the way that the county has from the beginning. And so we are working closely with our, social, with our safety net providers, the dental clinic, some of our early child could, uh, care providers and our early uh, social work with our, with our early uh, child care population to find and identify those families for whom they're unlikely to have a primary care provider and may not have the means to access a primary care provider. And so we are prioritizing in our distribution program and in our partnership with Montgomery County Public Schools, accessing that particular population that's disproportionately black and brown uh, to make sure that they have access in an equitable fashion with the rest of our, with all of our residents uh, to these uh, vaccines for the youngest population. Um, we believe that this is both obviously important from an equity standpoint, but as we have said with the earlier populations, we know that um, there's been a disproportionate impact and that because many of our, many of those um, participants are in group childcare settings, they, they may pose a greater risk of, of furthering community transmission and we can break chains of transmission by addressing uh, populations that are at the greatest risk. So I will applaud the Department of Health and Human Services for their efforts to continue to follow that equity framework and to identify places that are, that are important for us to reach. The other thing I want to highlight for today uh, is that as the county executive uh, requested a couple of weeks ago, we have gotten an extension on the FEMA public assistance notification. Uh, that that uh, notice uh, came down yesterday. Uh, they will continue post uh, July 1 to reimburse local counties for their emergency response uh, activities in eligible areas. Um, they will do so at 90% cost recovery as opposed to 100% prior to for activities incurred prior to uh, or on July 1st. Beyond that, it'll be 90%. So obviously, there will be a local um, essentially match that's uh, included in, in the cost moving forward. This is something we had planned for. And frankly, we will continue going to plan to continue our emergency response regardless of the reimbursement. But obviously, it is very helpful for us to receive that notice as well. The last thing I want to do is I want to, on behalf of the county executive, thank the county council for the interviews of the police accountability board members yesterday. Uh, having uh, sat in the room for those interviews, um, I want to thank again those applicants, both those who were selected, but those who we did not, for their willingness to step forward and for the applicants who were interviewed yesterday. Um, I was incredibly impressed with their answers to the questions. I think they reflected the values of, of, of uh, integrity and um, being moderate in, in their perception, uh, focusing on procedural justice and making sure that everyone feels that their voices can be heard and that they're gonna get a fair shake through this whole process, both the police and the community uh, together. So uh, that's all I have for today. I wanna thank, um, I guess we'll proceed to answer question and answers. Thank you, gentlemen. I believe the first uh, questions come from Steve Bonnell, Bethesda Beat. Good afternoon, Steve. Afternoon. Um, my first line of questions about the vaccine distribution. Um, I think I recall Councilmember Jawando saying that compared to other age groups, there actually is kind of less demand um, for this age group. So I just wanted the health officials on the call can kind of contextualize that, um, just what you've been hearing, and also uh, kind of the outreach that you're trying to do. I imagine as we get get going down further down the ladder here for younger kids there are a lot more questions about the vaccines kind of impact on younger younger individuals frankly so i'm just wondering if the health officials on the call can kind of answer those questions thanks thanks steve um 
you know, something we, we have seen as, as we've moved from our, our more senior populations down through each age group is that um, the, the demand has been slightly less each time. And we uh, experienced that with the 5 to 11. Um, we felt a, a very um, significant demand initially, especially as uh, the initial supplies were more limited as they did distribution. Um, but then it became more of a slow and steady uh, process of bringing people in. And, you know, I, I do attribute some of that to the, the increased challenge of, of trying to bring a, a child and schedule the, and coordinate the schedules of the parents and the children um, to go and, and get a vaccination. Um, that's certainly a little more difficult than a, an adult just stopping by when they're, when they're available. Um, so that there's some of that. There's also uh, some parents who um, do want to wait a little bit to see how this, uh, how this goes with um, other people they know and other children. Um, and we understand that there, there, there is some of that. What we have seen in our county, though, is, is still a higher demand across the board than most other jurisdictions that, um, that are tracking this. And uh, we are prepared for it. Um, we also know how important it is to be inclusive of all parts of our county, all populations in our county early on uh, because that helps with the buy-in. It helps when you know there are other people who have gotten this vaccine safely um, and so on. And, you know, the, the safety and efficacy trials uh, were kind of two parts of what both of these manufacturers went through. And um, the safety data has been very, very good. And, and there was really no uh, questions about that over the, the recent months. One of the challenges is looking at efficacy during a time when there are so many breakthrough cases. Um, and, and I know the manufacturers looked at different ways of measuring efficacy and eventually provided data um, that made both the FDA and CDC feel confident that the, the benefits of these vaccines outweighed the risk. So that's, that's what we're trying to, again, share with um, our community so that they can make these choices. Um, and we, are, we have been hearing lots of interest for several months um, from, from parents, from uh, child care providers, that they're really excited about uh, having these vaccines available. And I, I guess just the kind of, I kind of alluded to this about overall demand. Um, are you concerned about that or because the vaccine's going, you no, know, obviously through multiple avenues, you know, I think back to the start of the pandemic and I was a little bit more of a hunger games when the initial wave was happening and the vaccines were going out. I mean, how does this kind of, how do you think this compares to that drastic, you know, demand at the beginning of the pandemic? Well, I, I mean, there was at the beginning of the pandemic, the, the numbers were very, very different than what we're, we're looking at now. Um, but also, I, I again, I, I want to um, show appreciation for the the search engine tools that both the state and, and the and the federal partners have that make it a lot easier than at the beginning having to call all these different um, organizations to figure out uh, and, and try to get appointments. Um, again, we what we saw with the five to eleven was after a few weeks. Um, we, we had plenty of appointments available and it became easier for people. They, we could do walk-ups. We, um, which again, becomes more accommodating for populations, um, you know, to, to be vaccinated when they're ready, um, and not having to make an appointment. Um, and, and especially for our populations, um, we, again, we try to make our materials available in multiple languages and we try to do outreach in multiple languages, but, um, it just becomes easier when we can get to the point um, when we can get beyond appointment only. The one thing I want to add to this conversation too is I think you know if there's an initial reticence from some parents for their younger edu uh, students because they don't believe necessarily that the risk uh, outweighs the benefits. I think you know time will also sort of temper some of those expectations. Number one, as they see people get vaccinated, they see that there's no ill effects for them. But number two, as they continue to see closures of their facilities or or their student, you know, I think we recognize that, that this disease has become endemic. It's not a question of whether you'll get COVID or not. It's how many times in a given year you'll get COVID. And I think as parents begin to understand that the vaccination will reduce the risk to their students of getting ill, not prevent necessarily, but reduce, 
and reduce the need for quarantining and other, other procedures of, of, that, of that nature, I think they'll understand that there's a more pragmatic or practical benefit in addition to the health benefits that will change their cost benefit analysis with regard to the vaccination. So as they see that the risks are lower than they perceive them to be today, and that the benefits beyond just you know, helping to reduce illness and preventing hospitalizations, but in terms of just practical value of keeping more students in the, in the childcare settings or as they enter into school, in the school settings, I think that that will change people's opinions over time. And that's what we need to continue to remind them and convince them of through, through sharing of data about the safety and just sharing of information about the, the outbreaks that we're seeing continually in our childcare settings. Very thorough as always. Um, the other thing I wanna ask about actually is about this hotel relief fund. Um, and I don't know if anyone on the call has this information, but in this latest round, I couldn't find how much money is available that they kind of be able to give out through these hotel relief grants. Is anyone able? I don't know. I don't know if the can executive does, but I certainly don't. Uh, we could we could figure it out for you, Steve. We could, yeah. The executive was muted too. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I, could, I, 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 I was trying to. Say, I was trying to say it's five hundred a bed, but I do not know the total. And do we know the breakdown of follow up with the breakdown? You said ARPA funding. Do you know is it all ARPA funding or is the county also? I pitching? believe this was the ARPA fund. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Steve. I do not see any more requests. Questions from reporters? Going once? Going twice? I guess we're done for the day. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Stay safe, and we'll see you again next time. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Talk to you next week.